just going live. All right, and we are live right now. And I am gonna give people just a moment to kind of come in and get the notification that we're here because you know how YouTube is. <laughs> right. Takes a minute. It does. They'll be like, I didn't know we were live. Yeah, we've been live for 10 minutes now. So <laughs> <laughs> let's give everybody just a little quick moment to go in and I'm gonna post it on my Instagram as well. And so everybody can see it. I am so excited that you were willing to do this. Yeah, I'm I mean, uh I'm super excited. Uh you hooked me with, hey, I'm a planner. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, okay. when you when you said that back, I've been so excited. I've been telling everybody, I was like, y'all, and she a planner girl too. Like, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Looks like people are starting to trickle in. 804 here. And I'm so sorry about that time difference. Girl, it's throwing me off being up here because my computer still says like everything for central time. Got it. <laughs> and I'm still like, I'm like, yeah, we'll do it at seven. And then I was, I was and my friend was like, girl, it's already seven. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like freaking out. But um, yeah. yeah, you so awesome. Okay. So as people are starting to come in, um, you guys, I am Elaine Michelle. If you guys did not know, you clicked on the channel already. Um, and over here, we just do a lot of getting our lives together. And because of everything that's going on right now, I think it's important that we have these types of conversations and exposing people to different organizations that can truly help others to grow and to understand um, better how we can move forward as a community. And I think in our community, sometimes we think like, oh, we can't really do anything because we're just planners or we're just this or we're just that. But I think if people started thinking of it on that level, what can I do as a planner? What can I do in the planner community to help change some things? Um, and just really understanding what we're going through. I think that that will help us push the movement a little bit further. So um, I want to introduce uh, Christian and I'm so excited, you guys. She is also a fellow planner babe, okay? And um, she is the, is it executive director? Yes. Of, is that the official? Okay, she the executive, okay? <laughs> you, got, you got your regular directors and then you got executive director. <laughs> and I am so excited. She decided to have this conversation with us. And I really just wanted to have a conversation, just talk to you about your organization um, because I chose your organization based off of, I really saw that your organization really works and puts in the work in the community. I didn't just look at the website. I went on YouTube, I went on Instagram, checked hashtags, different things like that, because I wanted to see more than just uh, what people put on a pretty website, you know, because I think it's more than that. So without further ado, let's end, we have Miss Christian. So just tell us about yourself and, you know, how you kind of got started with the organization. Yeah, uh, so hey everybody, um, my name is Christian Snow. Um, like Elaine was just saying, uh, I am homegrown here in Chicago um, and have been you know, in this area, in this region for most of my life since um, school. I, Asada's Daughters, uh, for those of y'all who don't know, uh, we are a grassroots organization here in Chicago um, and we have a mission of organizing young black people here in Chicago uh, by providing them um, with uh, revolutionary services, organizing training, political education and leadership development for the greater purpose of uh, them going on to deepen, escalate and sustain um, the black liberation movement. And when we say that, what we mean is that we're hoping to have built a strong enough container, a strong enough framework um, for young people to come into um, who have the lived experiences of dealing with oppression throughout their life. And for them to have a safe space to learn political education, political theory um, about uh, power and oppression and how it operates on them and in their lives and have a space to build community with each other so that they can then organize themselves to organize the community to do something about the systems that are operating on their lives, the systems of oppression that are operating on their lives. Um, so it can, it can feel a little complex because what folks tend to know us for is what 
you know, you see out um, on a lot of social media, the big actions we do in coalition um, mm -hmm. with other organizations across the city. Um, a lot of the conversations around what it means to um, abolish police and prisons or the prison industrial complex or the criminalization of black people um, and what that might look like. You'll see a lot of that, but really, you know, we're a ragtag team of uh, black women and gender non-conforming folks who work intergenerationally with young black people um, in order to build up deep relationships with each other so that we don't leave each other behind and the struggle for our collective freedom. Uh, so that that is that's the organization. I the organization is about five years old. Um, I came in uh, after its first year, um, just as a collective. There were like twenty three ish dope black women and gender nonconforming folks um, who wanted to do this work of figuring out how we prepare for what mm -hmm. happened after that um, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown wave of. Um, Black Lives Matter. What? How do we prepare for the next time that folks can no longer um, handle the bondage, bondages of their oppression? Um, how do we prepare young people to be prepared for this moment that we find ourselves in now because we're right. students of history and know that, you know, it's constantly um, coming um, and uh, the waves of Black liberation um, push us forward. How do we prepare for that? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, was, it was awesome to be a part of that work while I was still in law school and figuring out like that the law was not something that was ever really going to save us as Black people. It was beautiful to have a home of, of Black women um, and gender non-binary folks um, who thought like I did, who appreciated things like I did, but who also pushed me um, in my own understanding of where we are and where we come from as a people and where we can go. So yeah. I love AD. I love everything about AD. I'm so grateful to still be able to work with, um, you know, Black women, um, pushing this organization forward to be able to learn from Black young people who have, you know, the spirit that I sometimes forget about um, <laughs> you know, having experienced the backlash that comes from that spirit there. Uh -huh. That's not where they are. And so being around them is constantly energizing um, and it helps me not remain complacent and stagnant. And I love it. It's a beautiful space. We grow in our space. We build in our space. We mourn in our space. We celebrate in our space and we hope, we truly hope to build the community that comes after um, you know, we finally get to the abolition of police and prisons, which is our goal. Awesome. That is that is really awesome. So you, you mentioned you went to law school. So tell us more about that, ma'am. Oh, yeah, that wasn't that was not fun. <laughs> was not a good time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm also a civil rights and criminal defense attorney, in addition to being the executive director of Asada's Daughters. Um, wow. And it's, it's not as special as it, as some people make it feel like, but I just see it as another tool and the toolkit um, for how we work to, you know, build up our community um, and uh, be there for each other. That's awesome. Girl, you is doing it. That is so <laughs> amazing. Um, I'm inspired just by knowing that, you know, you're, it, for me, that's like going the extra mile. You not only got knowledgeable, you know, went to school, got the degrees and stuff, but then you also took it back into the community so that you were able to impact the community in some way with what you were taught. And I think that's what sticks out the most is that it's black women and non uh, gender conforming um, working together to make a change and using the knowledge that they've been given to help push us forward and not to just hold it into ourselves and grow ourselves, but really going back and reaching back and getting others. Yeah, and, and for us, especially at ID, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, there uh, are so many spaces uh, where young people and, and, and intergenerationally folks can politicize themselves. They can gain awareness about um, what is happening. But we wanted to make sure that we could create a space for folks who are so busy worrying about their survival. Mm -hmm. um, that they didn't have the time or the energy or the space because, you know, sometimes space is a privilege. I tell young people that about college all the time, that sometimes college just gives you the opportunity to take space away to actually sit and think. Mm -hmm. um, 
even if you're not quite sure what you're going to, what it, where it's going to turn out. You know, I went to college thinking I was going to be an engineer and came out of it, you know, with a history degree and who, wow. like, who that, right. <laughs> and so we wanted to create a space for young folks who, who felt alienated by the language of a lot of movement spaces or felt mm -hmm. alienated by, you know, folks young people who had had access early on to a lot of the capital, the cultural capital that exists in movement spaces. We wanted to talk to young folks um, who, um, you know, don't have access to those things, who need a little bit more support, but who have experienced um, oppression so deeply that all their need is that little extra bit, that little extra theory that a yeah is us needs to be combined um, with practice in order to truly have an understanding of their experiences and to think collectively about what we can do um, in the future to free ourselves. Oh, wow. That's that's really, really big. I'm, I'm just so excited that I got a chance to um, find the organization in this time. And I know I wish I'm like, oh, I wish I would have been knowing this uh, long ago. I've been working with um, youth groups and things like that for some time now, since I can remember, honestly. Um, and so to know that there's an organization that really believes in the movement and understanding like how important education is, I think that's what stuck out to me the most was like how important educating our own community members is for us as a community. Like we have to be knowledgeable in whatever it is we're fighting for because we can go out and protest all day, we can go out and riot all day, all of that stuff. We can do that. That's great. But what matters is how do we act on the back end? How do we fix what's going on so that we don't have to riot, so that we don't have to go and protest as much? There'll probably always be protests of some sort. But I think that's important. That we, yeah, right. <laughs> we're hoping not, but you never know. They'll stop protesting something else. Um, right. But how do we make true progress? And that is through educating. And I love that your organization takes the time out. I looked at some of the resources and I was blown away by the resources you offer for free. But I can only imagine what you guys are offering to the um, to the girls and the young guys and whoever joins. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the education resources that you guys give out? Right. So uh, uh Asada's Daughters, our programming is divided into three different sectors. Um, we provide um, organizing training, what we call revolutionary support, um, which um, really is just to sustain their ability to participate um, in that. We say we uh, feed anyone who's hungry, we pay you for your labor, and we make sure that you get what you need to navigate capitalism. Um, and then our third pillar is political education, and that's actually how young people move through our organization. They start mm -hmm. as our neighbors um, and they become members of the organization after a few rounds of um, early political education. They do a year of unit-based political education and then they, they go into, they have the ability to move into our leadership where they get some okay. intensified support. In terms of political education, um, we actually bring most of that to the table or we partner with other um, educators to mm -hmm. uh, come up with units. Uh, Asada Shakur said, and it's, I think it's one of the quotes that people know um, her so well for, is that the oppressor is not going to give you the information you need to exactly. come back, right? They're not going to give mm -hmm. you what you need to do yourself. And so we do units on everything from what, who is Asada Shakur, what is abolition, um, what does food justice and eco justice look like when you pair it with a racial lens? What's a gender analysis? How do we think about misogyny, the patriarchy, um, gender binaries um, through a lens of what's occurring with Black folks? Um, uh, the Anything from the diaspora um, and what the liberation struggle has felt like. We do a history of the strategies and tactics that young Black people from the NAACP Youth Council to SNCC to the Black Panther Party, which most folks don't even realize the average age was around 17 or 18 um, to be in the Black Panther Party. What strategies and tactics and theories did they use? How did they work for them at the time? What context were they using them in? What can we take that we can apply to our current moment and what isn't applicable to us right now? What didn't mm -hmm. work for us 
for and just really doing deep dive studies of you know what was accomplished by our people for us and mm -hmm. where did it get us and what lessons can we learn in the past and we create those units in conjunction with our young people who've been a part of our organization they work to facilitate those units to think of what the themes should be to think about what the goals and outcomes should be and we work in partnership with them to then give it to the next um, wave of young people who are coming into the programming it's an each one teach one type of model so that we know that they know it and that we know that they can teach it and we know that they can take it with them wherever it is that they go. So it is really important. Political education is at our heart and at our core, but we also understand that it can look um, and many, it can appear in many different ways. We don't sit young people in a classroom. We teach through a popular education model that's rooted in restorative justice and transformative justice practices um, of circle keeping, of celebration, of taking accountability, of doing conflict resolution through building deep trust as a way to and through the deep trust that we've built with one another. Um, mm -hmm. We do it in a way where they can get their hands on stuff, where they can propose and vision and think about things. They learn through their own thoughts and understand that they are the masters of their own experience. And what we're helping bring to the table is really just the backing um, that they need to move it forward. So I say all that long-winded stuff to say it is a joint <laughs> effort. It mm -hmm. is Thing we really, really think deeply about, and that yeah. we for, and that you know we we um, will always be a, uh, at the core of our organization. I love that. I love that you said it's a joint effort, um, and, and that lets you know that you're not just working alone; that you're working with people, and that yeah. that helps continue to create the community atmosphere that we so often lack in different organizations or just in dealing with our own communities we don't work as a community together you know we have the resources right there but we're not using them so that makes me really excited even more um about your organization so if there was a way that we could kind of assist i know i'm normally in memphis i'm you know um how can we help or what are some ways we can help or use your resources or whatever how can we work with you far away yeah. So if you're uh, in Chicago or around Chicago, you know, one of the best ways to assist us is support um, some of our community um, driven efforts. Um, you know, we have or I always say, you know, and that's not actually something people should know. <laughs> <laughs> we have our, our community garden space um, where, you know, uh, folks, they plant um uh, in our garden spaces, and it's an intergenerational space that's really beautiful with some of the elders teaching some of the young people how to tend to um, their growing spaces, to their plants, to their crops, um, and, you know, where young people get to go and learn how do we provide for ourselves self-sustainable and people can support that effort. Um, we have a, re a resource distribution centers and spaces where um, we give out, uh, you know, a few times a week, a lot of resources that folks need. So whether that's food or baby supplies or pet supplies um, or cleaning supplies, whatever it is that folks need, if you're in the area and you want to support that, feel free to drop it off to our garden space um, or get connected with us. Um, and we can um, definitely always use those efforts. If you're far away, uh, we, we always uh, can take what we call sustainers, folks who um, commit to a low monthly donation. Uh, we always are looking for folks to host what we call the AD dinner parties. And so what that is, is uh, pretty much like the conversation you and I are having right now, except mm -hmm. it is a video call um, with a now, now COVID. It's a, it would be a video call with you and your friends and you pick an area of our political education that you'd like to know more about. And we come and do a short lesson, um, a political education lesson for you and your folks. Um, and oh, that wow. we ask you and your people to donate, um, but also we ask you to take the information that we're giving you and, and pass it on, um, again, in each one teach one um, type of um, moment. Uh, we're always um, looking to connect with folks outside of Chicago that way because political education is so core to who we mm -hmm. are. Um, outside of just supporting us, you can look for the local 
um, organizations that are our companions in the movement. Um, we are a local grassroots organization because we truly believe that relationships are what is what we need to get free. Uh, we need to be in deep relationship with each other. We need to walk through the messy conversations that help us unpack our internalized depression. Um, we need to know that you are my neighbor and I mm -hmm. have your back just like you have my back. And so that's why we stay hyper local. But okay. there are other organizations, no matter where you are, um, that are just like that, that you mm -hmm. can in this moment, I can't stress enough for folks to try to find their political home somewhere where you are with people who are like mind about what you think we need to get free and get to work. And we always need that because we would love, love, love for more folks to be out here doing this work. Awesome. Now, we do have a question over in the comment section. Um, is the organization in multiple cities or states? And if not, um, can they be formed? We are not in multiple cities or states. We have not formed a chapter model. Um, like I was just saying before, we're hyper local because we think context matters and we think mm -hmm. really matter. Um, but it is something that uh, keeps coming up in conversation. And so it's not out of the door for um, the future. Okay. Awesome. 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 I think that's what's important um, that we think about that, how we can work locally. So I know this may be something like maybe we find a resource and I don't know if you have one that you can recommend where we can find other grassroots um, organizations or like a finder or something of how we can get local and get connected. Cause I think that's one of the biggest things is finding something local that you can get yeah. connected to. Yeah, I think, and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that movement for black lives has a list on their website. Okay. I may be wrong. Um, and there's uh, another one that I can't think of off, off the top of my head, but there are there's a, a finder of black organizations focused on um, racial justice uh, in any place you might want. Uh, and I can send you that if you want to send that out. To oh, yes, please, later. please, yeah. please. Because I definitely would like to put that out there. Um, I know for me, I know it's kind of hard, but I, for, I'm like, we have people's attention now, right? So since yeah. we have your attention, let's have conversations. You know, right. so since people are paying attention to us, I wanna provide as many resources and things like that because I've always been invested in community and all of that. But like, I feel like now is the time that we really put the hard on focus of how do we really push this thing forward and not just a manner of, okay, yeah, we're, protesting, we're doing this and that, how do we really affect change? And affecting change has got to start from a local level. And I've been telling people this and low key, like I call it like preaching or whatever, but I've been <laughs> telling people this because if we, in school, they don't teach us a lot about our local legislation. They don't mm -hmm. talk about that, like on the local level, you know, how we can do this, this or this and how we can make change and how we can really, uh, affect where it goes from the state level to, you know, then to th the whole United States, but right. we don't learn that, you know? And so I think it's really important that we focus on that political education and, and make it make sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's critical too. Um, and I, I really echo what you're saying about being hyper local. You know, I forget who was saying it, but I, I definitely just heard a conversation where someone was like, some people th believe that as long as they vote every four years, that, that they've done their due diligence. Yeah. That is yes. that you do. And there's so much happening on the local scenes that affect you much more deeply than what's happening nationally. Yes, national has a uh, ability to set the tone, but there's so many things happening on a weekly basis in your mm -hmm. um, you know, school meetings, in your local neighborhood meetings, um, places where people are making decisions. I can't tell you the amount of times I've sat in a city council meeting and been like, well, if the public knew you were making this decision, <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure <laughs> that, they okay with that, that they absolutely wouldn't be okay with that. And part of it is like our elected officials, their job is to go to the people. Um, at least that's how it's supposed to work here. Um, but mm -hmm. a lot of times that's not actually what's happening. And so how do we make sure that our folks, especially our folks who don't have the time and space um, because right. of their own survival um, to think about these local issues, how do we make sure we get the information to them? How do we make sure they trust us as deliverers of that information? And part of that is just 
being a good neighbor. Do you know the folks next to you? We're in the middle of COVID. Do you know if someone has a need? Do you know if like you can run to the grocery store for you know one of the elders on the block? Can mm -hmm. you do that? Is that something that, that they need from you? Can you pick up someone's medication? Is someone worried about their child? Is there something that you can do for the folks on your block first? so that you can be in deep relationships with them, so that you can understand what everyone is going through, even if you aren't going through it yourself, and so that you guys can come together, you all can come together and speak as one voice or as a body to the powers that be yeah. about what you need. That's the first start of how you organize. Um, that's the first, I mean, I grew up in church organizing. I grew up as a, a PK. Okay. Start, you know, uh, and that was what we did. We would constantly walk the block and we would knock mm -hmm. on our neighbor's door. And it wasn't just because we needed them to fill out a survey. It wasn't just because of the census every 10 years. It wasn't just because it was before we had a need. It was to get at what their needs were and to make sure they knew we were here and they were never alone. So that's oh, just I love that. for everyone. Yeah, I love that. I, working locally, working in your own, on your own hood. Yes. <laughs> First, and then boosting it from there. That is so awesome. Okay. So um, just before we get out of here and we close up. Um, so everything that's been going on here recently has, like I said, gotten the attention of America. Their eyes are wide open. If there was something that you could share with others, um, especially with you being in Chicago, I know there are a lot of things going on in Chicago. Um you know, just share with us, how do we, how do you feel like we can progress from this? How do we actually, you know, create the change and things like that? I mean, a, a large part of it is what I just said about holding your own personal community out. Mm -hmm. um, another part of it is building deep within yourself, right? So think about what you've been encountering over the last couple of months that felt uncomfortable. Like, what are some of the things that have made you shift or think about uh, deeply held beliefs that you previously had um, mm -hmm. and try and learn and grow from there. Study, read, talk to folks. Don't just dismiss ideas outright because they're the first time that you're encountering them, right? That's probably mm -hmm. the biggest advice I can give, a uh, piece of advice I can give to folks. I've had folks reach out to me and say, defund police, that can never happen. Why would we ever do something like that? Right, like, right. Think about it. Like just back up and think about it. People have been thinking about these things for a long time. Just because you're coming to it, because you're encountering it, doesn't mean there's there's not study for you to do. But mm -hmm. you should do that in relationship with the folks around you. And the more of us who become aware in this moment of what the structures that act in our lives actually are, and what we can, what people have been thinking through about what we need instead, right? So the slogan goes: divest from policing invest in community. What could we mm -hmm. do with $4 million that you were going to use to build that cop academy in our communities? What right. could we do with $1.7 billion that the police get every year? The, what, what could we do with that, with the $24 million that they see every yeah. day? What could we actually build in our community and what would we need to feel safe? What does safety look like in this mm -hmm. moment? What actually makes you feel safe in your heart when you're thinking about it? Is it when people walk down your blocks with guns? Or is it when you mm -hmm. and your neighbor can resolve an argument, a disagreement through a conversation? Mm -hmm. Is it when somebody apologizes to you or you feel like you can apologize? You feel comfortable enough that someone will hold sacred your apology, right? Yeah. What is it that safety truly looks like for ourselves? And I just implore everyone to think about those things as they build with each other about what do we actually want to see in this world and how do we get it mm -hmm. through our relationships with each other? Because everything else is a stand in for those relationships. Mm -hmm. Every as a stand in for our unwillingness to do the work to build those relationships. Absolutely. Somehow we've gotten so far removed from working out our problems amongst each other. And as adults, as we like to say, um, we've lacked communication and structure within our own communities. And we've depended so long on the police to do all of these things that aren't necessarily police activities or where police actually need to be putting their efforts into crime. Yeah, I get it. Um, maybe them not showing up for a domestic violence 
situation, maybe sending someone who actually can help de-escalate and give them the therapy or um, the uh, what is it when they go to counseling, give them the counseling mm-hmm. and things that they need. You know, um, I listened to Keisha, uh, the I call her Keisha. I need to know her name, Mayor Keisha. My bad. In Atlanta, <laughs> um, I listened to her talk about how they are reallocating um, funds and how they completely change the way that they did their jail in Atlanta. Well, a lot of people don't understand that there's Atlanta and then there's like the outskirts of Atlanta. So there's all these other different, you know, subsidies of Atlanta. And so there was a jail in there. And so she took some of the funding from there and started putting it onto the streets, having people clean up the streets, having people um, working with elderly, um, passing out food, different ways that they, those people didn't lose their jobs. They just were shifted into a different focus. And I would love for more communities to look at how we can shift the focus into a positive mindset because we just put so much money into crime and to, you know, what people, bad things are people, you know, doing versus actually giving them a place to feel safe and to feel like they can grow and build within their community. If we gave people the resources and everything that they would need, I think it would really cut down on crime. Now, I'm not a crime expert. I just watch a lot of crime shows. But I'm, I'm, I'm like to believe that when people have what they need, you know, people go out and loot and steal and stuff because most of the time, like, it's something that they feel like they're missing. You know, so I want to get to the reason. What are you feeling like you're missing? Going and stealing fresh screen TVs is not going to solve your problems at home. You know, so I, I really, I really love the fact that I wish that we would really get down to what, what is it? D, D, divest. Y'all know I'm going to tear it up later. Somebody write it down. So that's what I'm going to tear it up later. Divest is, is, is divest from policing or divest from criminalization and invest in communities. And I, I definitely agree with you in the sense that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to speak legal language. <laughs> <laughs> but in the sense that, like, if we even talk, a, take a step and talk about crime, why do we criminalize or why has our society criminalized the types of things they've criminalized? You've criminalized standing around on a corner. Why has that become cr- criminal for you? Why, mm-hmm. why is being out past a certain time of night become a crime that then justifies, you know, uh, whatever the police have decided to do? It's like any time they kill our folks, they say, but he was running away. And then the part you don't hear is that second part that they say, therefore he should die. He was running yeah. away, so therefore he should die. He stole a bag of chips and therefore he should die. He robbed a bank and therefore he should die. Like mm-hmm. the second part of that, you have to yeah. say it out loud. And if you can't say that out loud and agree with it, then all of that, any other reason that you have for why that person was okay why the police were okay killing that person goes out of the window. And so again, it's about saying, what is it that we need and how do we get it? How do we get it so that we don't need police? And how do we get it so that we don't need prisons? How do we make it so society sees that those are not needs because we've decided to meet the needs that people have? There should be no, you in the midst of a global pandemic should be living on the street. You shouldn't be living on the street, period. It shouldn't be tied to our finances. But in the midst of a global pandemic, we can't house people, even with empty spaces. If if COVID didn't open that thought for you, why are there still people on the street? No one's in hotels. There's no one renting these Airbnbs. Why are there still all of these people on the street? If COVID didn't wait, open that up for you, maybe you want to think about it a little bit. Maybe mm-hmm. health shouldn't be tied to your employment. Okay, what else shouldn't be tied to your employment? Your health care. I can't go to the doctor because I lost my job because it's a yeah. global pandemic and people are not outside. What things should not be tied to, you know, capitalism, racialized capitalism? What things should actually be our right to survival? We should all have a right to survival. And yeah. what does that like, and what does that mean? So I definitely, I echo you, I hear you. And you know, this conversation is gorgeous. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love talking about it. We've just been, I think being at home has been really um, just breathing. Like I've just been able to like, ah, you know, express all of these different things and talk with my parents who are in their seventies mm-hmm. and really getting a chance to understand the different things that they've saw over their time span of being alive and just getting an understanding of 
my my dad and I talk and we, we say the same things. And it's like, what didn't we learn before? You know, this didn't work before. So what did we learn previously that we're still in the same position years later, 60 years later, we're still yeah. here, you know? So what is it that we need to learn and take away from this particular um, time? Like we, it's time, like you said, opening up your eyes. If you're not having that thought process of why, why is it okay to kill somebody because they were running away from you? You weren't in any imminent threat of your life being in danger. Why is that a thing saying it's okay for me to kill you? So now if we start putting that mindset switch and let's shift the way we're thinking about crime, let's switch the way we're thinking. Like you said, housing didn't even think about that. You know, we tie everything to our economy and how we, uh, how we can contribute to the economy. Um, exactly. If I have a good job, then I get better housing almost because then you still have student loans that play a factor in whether or not I can have a nice house or not because all of this stuff, but they want you to go to school. They want you, you know, it's all of these different things that play a factor and it's just time for us to really start looking at where we are right now, the things that did not work and let's start making changes. And yeah. no, it's not gonna happen overnight. We get that, we know that. But if we get the proper education, like we really can make some good changes and make them stick. Right. Right. And that is a piece of our work. And what I was explaining earlier, part of our political education is studying what happened before. What were the mm -hmm. conditions that existed? What did they use? What helped us? What hurt us? What were the goals? And were they go were they the goals that we want to carry forward? Or did we learn that that wasn't enough? You know, yeah. it was a hundred years after slavery was ended, almost to the year, we got the Civil Rights um, Act. And so what did what happened we never learn in our our school we just hear civil war and the civil war so everybody was free and then all of a sudden they were really angry during the civil rights movement they just popped off for some reason we don't really know what happened right, we don't know we don't know what happened like where, right? where did all this stuff come from yeah, yeah 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 and part of it is that you know <laughs> as the um again student of history as you know people black folks Black folks who had just been freed, Black folks who were free but were fighting for other Black folks' freedom, as they realized that physical, the eradication of physical bondage was not enough, like that wasn't the only definition of freedom, over that 100-year span, yeah, stuff started popping off again. Once we started realizing that every which way we turn, they were going to try to enslave us one way or the other again, mm -hmm. Yeah, things started popping off again and it comes and waves there. And don't get me wrong, that's an over, over, oversimplification of what was going on. But we teach young people to look at history and its chunks and mm -hmm. look at it as this whole of the ebbs and flows of how we gain freedom and how our definition of freedom has changed. Um, um, and what that means for what we're doing right now and what we're mm -hmm. trying to do right now and what freedom means to us right now. And at pair that with their lived experiences right now, because they're going to inherit this movement and, yes. see, and let them lead us, see where it takes us from what they're able to combine. Love that. Absolutely love that. Okay, so what I wanted to do was to give you, I don't know if you have connections to it, but we're donating to you guys tonight. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I did a free, um, I did like a freebie for the people who were watching or who know. I did a freebie giveaway and then all you had to do was to donate. And I started with dollar donations and went all the way up to $20. Um, wow. And so we were able to raise $800 to give to you guys um, in the past week. And as more comes in, I'll be depositing it, you know, doing more donations. But I added everything all together and then I added some more from my own money to give to you guys. And I hope that we can continue to build a, you know, relationship and keep working together, whatever I can do to help bring awareness. If you want to come on the channel and just, you know, have a platform to come and talk to people. Um, I am open and willing because education to me is so important and I respect and love what your organization is doing. And so when you get a chance, you ha may have already gotten a notification, but I have already um, went ahead and I'm going to try to pull it up. Let me see if I can share my screen because <laughs> I'm a little, I'm trying to get a little fancy. <laughs> uh, let me share a tab here. Um, okay. Try not to get all in the information, but um, hopefully you guys can see. Um, but right there, we donated $800 and there was a feed down at the bottom. Oh, but um, 
I, yes, as you guys can see. So I want to make sure. I like to do that because I know that some people, they be like, okay, I donated. Did you give the money for real, for real? And I thought it would be a good thing to, you know, show everyone that we are giving you the money and that we, you know, we appreciate everything that you're doing. And thank you so much for coming on tonight and just giving us education. Again, my platform is open whenever you need us <laughs> or you just want to um, spread the word about something. Please, please, please use me. Um, I, I, I just... I'm in awe. So, <laughs> oh my God, we really appreciate that, and I truly, truly appreciate that. You know, from one planner girl to the next. Maybe next time we can talk about how we plan the movement because <laughs> yeah, I probably, there's so many of us in 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 this space um, mm -hmm. that we like. My friend and I were just talking about the other day her color code system. My friend, one of my colleagues, and I were talking about her color code system. But I am so grateful that you uh, reached out and that y'all were interested. I love this community. It's its own community. I'm appreciative of you wanting to use your platform. And yeah, let's do it again. Yay. So thank you so much, Christian, for coming on tonight. And we will be in touch. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined the live tonight. Oh, Elaine, I think your sound cut out. I don't know if it was just me, but it cut out. Mm-mm. I don't know. It's probably just me. Yeah, sounds off. <laughs>